let's get started. Let's let's start talking about uh, tips and tricks for sh shade selection. So the first thing I want to remind everybody is uh, please visit our webpage. Uh, we have this link uh, on our webpage on our main page uh, called webinars, and you can see it outlined here in this slide. Um, if you click on that link, you will find numerous topics that we're going to be talking about throughout the year. Uh, you are allowed. You will be able to um, reserve your seat on on these webinars prior to them being uh, promoted in other other social media uh, venues. Uh, we only have 100 seats available per webinar, so um, it's, it's it's good that you reserve them uh, with time. So please take advantage of our webpage and go in and visit and uh, select you know click on that webinar button so that you can see the topics that we will have in the future. You may find some topics there. Uh, that are going to be of interest for you or for anybody that uh, other than is that you know we highly recommend that you share our webpage with others as well. Uh, another thing that I would like you to uh, do is uh, to visit us on Instagram. It's uh, we're having we have had now I think two or three live interviews uh, through Instagram. So it's a it's a nice social media platform. We only share in our web in our uh, um, Instagram page. Uh, things related to dentistry, uh, things that we, we're either doing or we're going to be doing. Uh, we normally interview people from other specialties so that you can kind of get a, a glance of, you know, what other specialties are doing and how can they, or how can we as general dentists interact with other specialties. So, you know, it's a, it's a good, it's a good way to stay communicated. So I would highly encourage you to visit our Instagram page as well. So let's get started. Let's get started with our tip and trick number one. So the first thing I want to share with you, and I, I want to start this from the very basic. I, I know that I have that we have a lot of our followers that are younger dentists or you know dentists that are or, or, or students that are just getting ready to leave dental school to graduate and start their practice or work in a practice. So we want to start from from the things that I believe that are very basic, but at the same time, uh, some of us that are been doing this for a while, sometimes we forget these things and when we remind them to ourselves, we kind of understand the importance of, uh, you know, keeping them always in mind. And you, you, will may you, will, you, you may have a case where you can present more difficulties. And by reminding or remembering the basic things, uh, you sometimes may find some solutions to, you know, common problems. So the first thing that I want to share with you is related to enamel and dentin. And it's literally related to histology. Uh, you know, we know the way that the enamel or the thickness of the enamel, the way that it starts very thin at the gingival third, and that it, it thickens out towards the incisal edge. So when, when you look at, the, at this photo on the right-hand side and you look at all those four yellow arrows that I've placed on this slide, I want you to first, we're gonna start from the, ginger, from the cervical portion of the tooth, and I want you to look at that first yellow arrow, and I want you to look at the thickness of the enamel at that level. And at the same time, I want you to look at the thickness of the dentin. So this will kind of give you an idea of why the tooth normally is more saturated in the gingival third. That being said, when, we, when we're trying to restore teeth, if you're gonna restore a, a tooth with a full composite veneer, now you may think or you may wanna add a little bit more dentin towards the cervical portion and leave a thinner layer of enamel on top of your composite la dentin composite layer. And the reason why you would do that is so that you can get more of that saturation, you know, following the following nature, following the way that the tooth is actually, uh, the histology of the tooth that was actually developed. You know, you wanna have that more saturation on the middle, uh, on the cervical third. You wanna have less of that saturation on the middle third, where you're gonna have a thicker layer of enamel compared to the one that you have on the gingival third, but then you have a little bit less dentin because that's the area you can see the pulp chamber extending all the way down to that middle portion of the crown. So you're gonna have a little bit less thickness of dentin. This is the area where we normally see a more stable color. This middle portion of the tooth where you see that second and third arrow right in the middle portion of the tooth, you can see that those areas, that's the area where normally the tooth has a more stable color. There's less intris intrinsic effects that may, uh, that may alter or, or modify uh, the color of the tooth in that portion in relationship with the cervical portion or the incisal third. Let's go all the way down now to the incisal third. And what happens there? You see thicker enamel, a lot thinner dentin. So now you're seeing much less dentin, much less of that opaque substrate. You're gonna have some room for some gray appearance, for some halo effect. Why? Because now you can see that the lingual enamel layer and the facial enamel layer 
meet all the way down in that incisal edge. And that those, those two layers of enamel that, that meet at that level will create that white halo line on many of our young patients. So when you think about this, now you understand why it is so difficult for us to kind of uh, redo or replicate nature when we're doing composite veneers. Because if you have a tooth that is saturated in the gingival third, and then the saturation decreases while you're going to the incisal third and end up in the incisal third with a lot of you know, grays and blues and white halo, now you suddenly understand that there's, not, there's gonna be more than one shade or opacity that you're gonna to need to use in a restorative material in order for you to be able to replicate what nature literally is bringing up to the table. So I want you to keep this picture in mind. I personally always keep it in mind and I, and I try to understand, okay, if this patient is older and I have now some incisal edge wear, would I have a white halo or a white line in the incisal edge? And the answer to that question would be no. Could I do to wear? Could I have some of that gray or translucent effect diminish over time? The answer to that question is yes. So restoring a, a tooth or a, with a veneer, with a composite veneer on an older patient is going to be different than restoring a tooth uh, with a composite veneer on a younger patient. And that's what we have to do. That, that's what we have to understand. And that's how we select the shades. That's how we normally would go out and buy a kit, uh, a composite kit, so that depending on the age population that we have in our practice, you know, if we have a combined age, age population, younger patients and older patients, well, you may need to have, you may need to stop yourself because you're gonna be all around, you know, going from white halos to grays, all the way up to just single shades or maybe two shades, maybe one dentin and one enamel. So uh, again, keep that in mind. Now, how can you help yourself? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later in the presentation, but I just wanna show you this first case. And it's just one photo. This is, the, this is the slide. And all I did for this patient, because I want you to think about this patient and I want you to uh, imagine yourself having to restore a class four or a full composite veneer on this patient. But let's look at first at that left-hand photo. If you look at the left-hand photo, this is, these both photos are the same patient. First, without bleaching, photo on the right is after bleaching. So why am I talking about this? Because now that we know our substrates, now that we know that we have thinner enamel on the gingival third, thicker enamel on the incisal third, and that may, we may have some gray and some white halo effect on the incisal edge on younger patients, you can see that this patient still has a little bit of those uh, uh, tertiary characteristics on the incisal edges, a little bit of the mammalon uh, 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 tertiary um, anatomy on those uh, uh, incisal edge mammalons. So you can see that he hasn't had a whole bunch of wear. So if you look at this patient on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a lot of uh, color differences on the incisal third. But after bleaching, and this photo was taken 60 days post-bleaching on the right-hand side, you can see that I've been able to create a single color, very little color trans, uh, very little um, color gradient from the gingival third all the way down to the incisal third. I stabilized this color to a very, very light, very high value color which patient now would you think is easier to restore? The one on the left-hand side or the one on the right-hand side? The most definitely the patient on the right-hand side. You're going to have to choose less colors. You're going to have to use, you know, you, you're probably going to be able to get away restoring a class four or a full composite veneer on this patient with one dentin and one enamel, one enamel shade. On the other hand, if you were to treat the patient on the left-hand side, you would have to have some blue, you would have to have a little bit of gray, you're gonna have maybe even a little bit of brown or ochre. You're gonna to have to have a lot more in your inventory in order for you to restore a patient like that. So keep that in mind because bleaching, I always consider bleaching as my first step in any highly aesthetic restorative case. I wanna to try to increase the value as much as I can so I can simplify the way uh, that I can uh, select the shade at the time of, of restorative. So now let's go to tip and trick number two. And tip and trick number two, we're gonna now talk about how do we select the shade? What are the things, what are the parameters that we have to look into when selecting a shade? And one of the most important things, and, and at least for me, I, I normally use, I would say 95% of my cases, I, I would normally uh, isolate with using a rubber dam 
uh, prior for me to, you know, doing any type of restorative work. That's just me. Now, even if you don't use a rubber dam every day on every single case, you may use, you know, some cotton rolls or you may use an isolite or an isovac. So you're going to have other means of isolation in order for you to be able to restore, you know, a, a case. And we all know that. So when you isolate, now you're going to get tooth dehydration. So we're going to lose a little bit of water and that tooth is going to appear to be lighter. So it's very important that the first thing you do before you select, you know, before you start anything and you do any type of isolation is select the shade because the key important feature to understand here is that dehydration is always going to give us a higher value and you will always end up having a lighter restoration. So you don't want that to happen if it's a single tooth or if it's only two teeth or if it's just a portion of a tooth, you want to try to match it as close as possible. And for that to happen, you want to make sure that the first thing you do is go ahead and select your shade, your basic shade. And we'll talk about that soon, but select that basic shade without having any dehydration. Another important thing that you want to keep in mind is that you want the teeth to be clean. So if the patient comes to your practice and you know there's a fractured tooth or there's a tooth, a front tooth that needs to be restored and it's a very highly aesthetic case, you want to make sure that this patient goes through your hygiene uh, um, uh, section in your practice, hygiene chair first, before you go, you go back and restore. So you put them through hygiene, you send them home, you have them come back, and that's when you start selecting your shade. Having, you know, plaque and having a, a, a calculus or, or, or inflammated tissues or bleeding while you're selecting the shade is really not the way to go, and I think that we all know that. So tip and, th and trick number three would be, now we want to be brief. So we know now that the patient is ready for us to select the shade. We haven't isolated yet. Teeth are not dehydrated we want to go ahead and select the shade. So the first thing that we're going to do, and I'll talk a little bit about the position of the actual shade tab, and you're seeing it right here on my right-hand photo, but this photo is not to talk about the position of the, of, of the shade tab, and we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit about that. This photo is more about how brief you want to be when you're selecting the shade. If you are, if you are, you know, if you just stare at the, the shade tab and you stare at the patient's teeth and you're looking at these teeth for, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 50 seconds, well, hey, you know, now you start doubting and you start getting other shade tabs and you start, you know, just, you know, going all around your, your, your Vita Pan shade tab and now you're just lost. So you want to make sure that you keep it brief. You want to make sure, and one tip that I'm going to give you is that when you look, if you ask any lab, and I know that Glidewell came out a couple of years back ago with some information that I thought it was valuable because what they say is that the number, you know, 80% of the times what they're getting in their, in their lab orders are shades that for front teeth are shades that have that are related or that are based out of that first block of shade tab in the A range. So what I normally do is I know that my patients normally are going to be in that A range. I just don't know if they're going to be in the A1 or in the A4 range, but I know that most likely they're going to be in that A range. So what I normally do is I grab my Vita uh, 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 pan and I kind of just glance it right in front of their teeth with those four or five A shades right next to the teeth and just kind of see, okay, is he or her in that, in, or is he or she in that range? And if I find that they're in that range, now I can simplify that. And that's how I simplify those three to five seconds. So once I, I know that I select one of those A or B or C, whichever shade you, you chose, again, I already said, you know, 80% of the times you will find your patients falling into that group in the A, in the A range unless they're all bleached their teeth. And now you're going to find them in that, ble in that B range. But if you find them in that A range, well, hey, you know, I would go ahead and just select A2 or A3 if they haven't bleached their teeth and go about saying, okay, two to three seconds, how close are they to this shade? And what I'm trying to do here is I'm just trying to obtain the basic shade. I'm not trying to look at characteristics. I'm not trying to look at the gingival third, how saturated it is. I'm not trying to look at the incisal edge. Does he have any white spots? Uh, does she have any white halo or does she have any gray or mammalons visible through the enamel? I'm not looking at that. All I'm looking at is my basic shade. And that's 80% of my restoration. That basic shade is that first color that actually stands out. And that's the first one that I want to choose. Because again, you're going to have to add all your effects. That's a separate step. That's something totally different. It has nothing to do with your basic shade. Your basic shade is going to be that 80% of your restoration where you're gonna to try to match as much as you can the basic color in, in, in intrinsic, in, uh, embedded in that tooth, given by who? Given by that thick dentin on that middle third. And again, we'll talk about that as well. 
So the other thing that I want you to know is that after those three to five seconds, if you are like in between two shades, let's say that you're in between A2 and A3, and you're like, well, you know, I'm not 100% sure if, if, to go one way or the other, the next step that I recommend doing is always squint. You squint your eyes, you let less light come into your eyes, and now you're gonna be able to concentrate and see, okay, which one appears to be the closest one possible. And this is important to understand. I'm not looking for a perfect match. And to be honest with you, it is very rare that you will find a perfect match because Vita Pan Shade Tab was not made for composite. It was made for ceramics. So you're not gonna really find any composite system out there to match your Vita Pan Shade Tab. I'm gonna go even a little bit further. You're not even gonna find an A2 composite made by one company match an A2 composite made by another company. So there's a lot of differences out there in the market between all the companies and all the brands that we have out there based on their shades. So you're really only trying to look for something that matches as close as possible to what you're seeing on your patient because you're gonna to have to do a couple of other things to finally select your basic shade. But for now, we want to be in that broad spectrum. So if you have A2 or A3 and you're kind of in between both and you're not 100% sure which one to choose, then you go ahead and squint two to five more seconds and then you say, okay, this is the one that matches the best. Let's say that we chose A2. That's the one that we're going to go by to select now our basic shade or our dentin shade in our composite restorative system. So now let's go to tip and trick number four. So tip and trick number four is now understanding your Vita Pan shade tab. Again, I'm, you know, I've been telling you that this is, this is not the best tool. This is not made for composite, but you know, we still use it. So I have to give you some ideas of, okay, if you want to use it for composite, how can you use it effectively so that you get the best information out of your Vita, Vita Pan shade tab? And I want to show you this because this is very important for you to understand. When you look at the tooth, in that Vita shade tab. Let's look at the one that I have right here on the screen, the A3. And you can look, you can see that, that you know, the actual two shape with all the colors. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that the gingival portion of this Vita shape tab is different. It's higher opacity, greater saturation than the middle portion of your Vita shade tab. And that middle portion and gingival portion is different than the high translucency and halo present on the incisal portion of the shade tab. So when you look at all these three uh, sections or, or these three um, uh, portions of the shade tab, I just want you to focus on the middle portion. That middle portion is where that color, that A3 color is solid. That middle portion is what the companies use to actually fabricate their composites. That middle portion is what the companies try to match when fabricating their composites. So that's the one that you have to concentrate your eyes on. And you know, sometimes I actually recommend a, a dentist to you know, have just one Vita pan only for composite restorations. And if you decide to do that, all you need to do is just section or cut away the gingival portion and cut away the incisal portion. Just leave that middle third in place that's the one that you're going to use to select your basic shade from now on. That's the one that you want to try to match with that basic shade. And I'm going to show you this photo. This is the portion that we want to concentrate our eyes on. This is the portion of that Vita Pan that we're going to use to select our basic shade. And I'm just going to split it for you. Now you see on the left hand side, it's only the middle third. And I want you to look at how nice and even the color is, uh, is, um, is actually present in that middle third. Now I want you to compare it to the right-hand side. On the top right-hand side, you see the cervical third. And on the lower right-hand side, you see the incisal third. Now you can see that all these two colors that are present, all this different you know, grayish and brownish and, and, and more orange or red present in, this, in these photos on the right-hand side are totally different than that stable, nice, even-looking color that you have on that middle third of your shade tab. So that's the portion of the shade tab the Vita Pan shade tab that you should be using when selecting your basic shade for direct composite restorations. Another thing that I want to share with you, just to show you, you know, the, the, the different ways of using the Vita, and I find these photos every single day uh, in different uh, articles that are published in the literature. And, you know, it just bothers me that we're teaching people through these manuscripts how to do things the wrong way. And I'm going to show you, look at the photo on the left-hand side. 
this is a very common way of people selecting their shade. Using the shade tab oriented in the same direction as a natural maxillary tooth, like you're seeing on the left-hand side, and now they put it right next to the tooth to see if, they, if, if these colors match. Now I want you to look at this photo because your eyes, when you are looking at this in the clinic, the same thing is gonna happen. If you look at my photo, you can see that there's a shadow on half of number eight that has been created by the actual shade tab. So the shade tab is blocking some light that is hitting number eight and now it's altering the actual color of number eight. If you look at the photo and you compare number eight and number nine, you can see that number eight appears to be slightly darker or less value than number nine. Why? Not because the tooth is darker, just because of the shadow that has been created by the shade tab. So even in these little things, these little tips and tricks, you're gonna see immense improvement, great improvement in your outcomes just by doing this. Just by, you know, placing your, your, the tooth in the shade tab in a more horizontal position. And now you can see that what I normally do and recommend is put it in that, in that normal, in that horizontal position as seen on the photo on the right-hand side of the screen and just put it on the incisal third. All you want to concentrate your eyes on is that middle portion of the shade tab and the middle portion of the tooth. If they match, then, then you know, and again, the match is never going to be perfect. You just want to make sure that you're close enough that you can make this composite restoration disappear. That's the ultimate goal. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of my presentation. Now, this is another mistake commonly made. And again, I find it published in many manuscripts when I'm reading the literature. You see my photo on the left-hand side, and now you see the shade tab, the Vita Pan shade tab, is now being tilted, oriented, from the incisal down to the cervical portion. So now we're actually trying to match the incisal portion of the Vita shade tab to the incisal third of the actual tooth. Now, see, by removing the shadow on tooth number nine, now both eight and nine appear to be the same. But when I'm looking at the shade tab, I'm trying to concentrate on the lightest aspect of the shade tab, which is the incisal third, which has all this gray and all this white and the mammalons and the effects and a little bit of brown. Give me just a minute, something happened here. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, I, something, something just jumped in my screen and took me out of the, uh, of the presentation, but I, I'm gonna go back right now. So now you can see that by removing the shade tab right next to, the, to number eight, I was able to remove the shadow. Now eight and nine appear to be the same. But again, I'm just trying to, I'm, my eyes are looking at that incisal third of the shade tab, which is lighter than that middle third. On the right-hand side, again, I'm looking at the middle third of the tooth, now, if you look at number eight, if you look at number eight on the right hand, on the left hand side, without the blue marks, I want you to look at that middle third, and I want you to look and see how nice and even that color of that tooth is in that middle third. And I want you to compare it to the incisal third, where he's got all these white spots and you know a little bit of halo and a little bit of gray on the mesial and distal, a little bit of brown. So there's so much color in that incisal third, or yeah in size of third compared to the middle third that that's the reason why that's the area i don't want to select my shade i want to look at the middle third of the beta shade pan or she beta shade tab i'm sorry and the middle third of the actual tooth i want to restore just like you're seeing on the right hand photo and now i'm blocking out everything and i want you to look at the middle third of that tooth and the middle third of the beta shade tab and ask yourself do they match and you know they are a close match maybe a little bit more saturated. Maybe I can use an A2 and, and try to find and see if, if A2 matches better. But overall, the goal of this presentation and my goal with this photo is just for you to see where exactly you want to aim your eyes at and how you need to, you know, how you need to go about selecting this basic shade, which by the way, is the most important aspect of shade selection. If you're going to do a layered composite veneer where you're going to use dentin enamels and some effects, well, hey, guess what? your dentin is gonna be 80%, and that's what we're selecting right now. So if you, if you select the wrong dentin, 
you, 80 percent of your restoration is going to be wrong so keep that in mind tip and trick number five so this is about color grading where we just we just we're talking about that you know and i want you to look at i'm going to show you different cases i want to show you different patients photos just to see how how much this varies one patient to another if you look i'm going to restore in this particular case tooth number eight obviously but i have tooth number nine being intact i'm not going to show you the restoration on number eight i just want you to look at this photo and i want you to look at number nine and this is what i look at when i'm seeing these patients when i'm gonna you know when i'm getting ready to restore i look at number nine and I can see that color gradient starting in the gingival portion and then going, you know, becoming a little bit more stable in the middle third and then going wild in that incisal third. Now, let me walk you through number nine. If you look at number nine on the gingival third, you will see a little bit of the yellow, but you will see some pink. Why are you seeing pink? You're seeing pink because enamel is, you, as we all know, it's a translucent mineral. And now you can see the tissue, the actual gingival tissue surrounding that cervical portion of the tooth. And you can see some of that pink tissue, some of the color of that tissue going through the enamel. If you look at the mesial gingival aspect of number nine, you can tell that there's a little bit of pink in that area. So again, there's a lot of things that are modifying and altering the color in that gingival portion, not to mention how thin the enamel is. Obviously, because the enamel is very thin, 0 0.20 to 0 0.30 of a millimeter in that gingival portion, you're going to see more of that saturated dentin showing through that area of the tooth. But when we go to the middle portion of number nine, look how nice and stable the color becomes. Now, I mean, it's very easy to tell that there's basically one color in that middle third. There's not a lot of color changes. There's, not, there's no tissue affecting the actual stability of the color that I'm seeing in that middle third. But then I jump to the incisal third. And what am I seeing on the incisal third? You see, right on the incisal edge, right where that little notch is on the mesial aspect of number nine, you can see that very white line that goes from mesial to distal. And that line is what? Less than 0.5 of a millimeter thick. But then right on top of that line, what do you see? You see a little bit of translucent white towards the mesial, you see a little bit of translucent gray towards the distal line angle, you see a little bit of translucent brown or orange. So now you're seeing all these other colors that are playing a huge role in this, in this single tooth. So I want you to think about if I need to restore number eight and it's right at that incisal third, this is not gonna be an easy case. And the most important thing that I want you to understand is that not only this is not gonna be an easy case, but this is not gonna be a single shape case. And that's what really this lecture comes down to. It is very rare that in aesthetic dentistry, in anterior direct restorative procedures, you are going to use a single shape. That's not that common. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You could do it. And I'll show you a case where I did it. You can do it, but you have to understand that when you do it, maybe your results are gonna be compromised. But the question would be, how compromised would they be? And I'll talk about that towards the end of my presentation. Again, color gradient, this is a totally different patient. You see, totally different characteristics. If I have to restore this case, and I am gonna restore this case, I'm not gonna show you the restorative aspect of the case, but I want you to, I wanna share with you how I go about selecting the shape. Now look at these teeth. You know, you can see that they're brighter, the value is, is higher. You can see that there's a solid color from the gingival third all the way down to the border of the middle third and the incisal third. In the incisal third, you see all this white spot. You don't see any gray, you don't see any halo, you don't see any translucent effects. So maybe this case, I would be able to get away with a single dentin shade and then adding some white opaque tint on that incisal third to reproduce the white tint on the incisal third of number eight. Or I may microabrade, I may do a microabrasion, I may do a resin infiltration, try to get rid of the white spots and then go ahead and restore number nine to match number eight. But I, you know, what I want you to think is how do I go about analyzing these cases? If you go to the gingival third of number eight, you don't see any of the pink tissue showing through the enamel. What does that mean? Well, it, it may mean that there's a thicker enamel or that there's more opaque dentin in that area and the tissue is very, very thin. It's a very thin tissue. 
So in this particular patient, and again, every single patient is different, you're gonna see less of that. You're not gonna find what you find on one patient on every other patient. So that's why you have to understand that you have to go about selecting your shade individually. And this is when dental photography also becomes very important. Because if you think about it, would you be able to look at all these details, all the details that I'm talking to you about right now in that first uh, appointment that you only look at your patient and you barely look at, at their teeth? No, you're not. They'll go home, they'll come back the next day for you to restore. And if you're gonna restore him that day, that's even gonna be worse because you're not gonna have any recollection because there's nothing that you have seen and that you've studied enough before going about restoring the tooth. So what I like to do is I, I like to take the photo. I don't like doing the restorations the same day. I look at the photos, I analyze the shade, I map the shade, and then I go about restoring my case. It has helped me tremendously uh, uh, you know, compared to when I, did not, when I didn't do this, because if the restoration ended up not being ideal, I had to remove or alter the restoration anyway. So in my mind, when you do aesthetic dentistry, you want to step up, you want to take a step back and you always want to look at your cases very, very in depth so that when you go and sit the patient on the chair and start working on their teeth, you know, you have a plan, you have an idea of what you're going to combine, what you're going to use, what you're going to mix in order for you to be able to get an ideal or a, or a good result. Again, look at this patient over here. We're only talking about color grading. Look at every single tooth that I've shown you right now. All these three cases are totally different. Now you can see this is more of a square tooth, a thick gingival biotype. You can see uh, you know, the, the color in the gingival third and the middle third are slightly different. You can see that the gingival third is a little bit more saturated. The middle third is a little bit lighter, but you can see now that the color effects on this particular patient extend beyond the incisal third. They actually are within portion of the middle third. So the way that the mammalons, the orange, the blue, the gray, the white, all those colors that you're seeing in that middle incisal third and lower aspect of the middle third, you're going to have to reproduce if you're going to restore the, any tooth on this patient's mouth. And that's what I want you to think about. Again, you have, if, if, you, if you want to get into this type of dentistry, you have to have a number of, uh, of, of shades and opacities and a number of tints so that, you can, that they can help you achieve these colors. Or you're going to have to you know, do something different, you know, maybe bleach and try to modify a little bit. They should try to increase the value and see if that can make it a case easier. And that's what I do. When I am confronted with these more difficult cases, I... I always talk to my patients about bleaching and you know it's even a good idea that you may combine what your fees are for direct restorative procedure highly aesthetic direct restorative procedures you may combine them with the fee that you have with, for bleaching maybe give them a discount maybe just put it in one single price so that your you, your patient feels more that you're giving the bleaching away and that you're just going to restore the tooth because at the end of the day adding that bleaching product and you don't even have to charge a whole bunch for it. I don't, I mean, personally, I wouldn't even mind just adding whatever cost it has to me, added it to my restoration, because at the end of the day, it's going to simplify my technique and it's going to uh, most likely improve the result, the, the end result of my restoration. One last case that I'm going to show you for color grading. Again, look at this nice and color, nice and base color, basic color all the way from the gingival third towards the incisal third very, very little changes of color. This is a single shade tooth, but now you can see the white spots, you know, the, 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 a little bit of fluorosis or hypomineralization of enamel present in this patient. So if you were not to remove those and you were to um, go on restoring her natural teeth by means of replicating that, if you just had to restore one, one tooth on this patient, then now you understand that you're gonna need those things. But there are cases where you can use a single dentin shade add a little bit of, uh, of, of color modifiers and you are good to go. Or you can use, if there's no dentin to replace and only enamel, you can use a single enamel shade, add a little bit of your tints and go about that day uh, and, and you know getting the result, a good result uh, in this case. And, and I wanna show you this case, just to, just to exemplify what I just said a couple of minutes ago. When you have cases like this, bleaching helps you achieve a more, uh, a, be a better outcome in your restorations. If you look at the photo on the left-hand side, you can see that the patient has a little chip on the incisal edge of number nine. But look at the color, look at the gray, the brown, the orange, the white, 
I mean, look at all those intrinsic colors that I would have had the need to reproduce in order for me to restore that very small chip that the patient had on tooth number nine. So what did I do? I went ahead and just did what I just told you. I gave them bleaching products. I told them, let's go ahead and go bleach your teeth. This is gonna simplify everything. What you're seeing on the left-hand photo, on the right-hand side photo, it's a 60 days post-op. Now you can see that I've not only bleached the, the, all the teeth, but look at number nine and look at the incisal edge. There's no more fracture. I restored that incisal edge of number nine by using a single shade of composite. And the reason why I was able to do that with a little bit of white tint, the reason why I was able to do that, I used enamel and a little bit of white opaque tint was because I was able to uh, go about bleaching his teeth, increasing the value of his teeth, and then uh, making sure that I was able to match uh, the shape. And I know that somebody raised their hands that you, you may have be having some questions. I would highly encourage you. I am going to give you time to ask your questions at the end, and I will answer your questions live. So I, I will just concentrate on answering your questions towards the end of my presentation, okay? So just make sure that you write them down or put them in that dialogue box that you see on the front of your screen, and I will make sure that I will, uh, I will take your questions at the end of my presentation. So in general, what is the rule that you need to follow? And this is not my rule. Uh, this is actually published by Dr. Marcos Vargas in 2011, where he literally stated that if you have a tooth that has very little to no color gradient, you may be able to restore this with two opacities, one dentin and one enamel. But if you have a tooth where you have a, a very clear uh, color gradient from gingival third all the way down to the incisal edge, well, you're gonna have to use, you're gonna have to cr uh, be creative, use a layering technique and be able to, to reproduce all those little characteristics that you, that you would normally find in the incisal third. So uh, just keep that in mind. Let's go to tip and trick number six. And for this tip and trick, what I wanna share with you is a little bit of evidence. And I'm just gonna show you one article, just three little sentences that I wanna share with you. I don't wanna make this a, a scientific uh, uh, lecture. I wanna make it more of a clinically applicable lecture, things that you can use you know, next time that you go to practice. So that's my ultimate goal with all my tip and tricks uh, presentations. But I do want you to understand because some of us, you know, I normally, I'm very hard with myself when I'm evaluating my restorations. You know, our ultimate goal and everybody that's here with us today in the morning, I think that you all have, I mean, if you're up on a Saturday at 11 in the morning to listen to me talk, it's because you have the same passion that I have for dentistry. And at the end of the day, what we all want to try to achieve is that we want to try to achieve ideal results with our patients. And that's our ultimate goal. And we sometimes are a little bit hard on ourselves. You know, we sometimes are like, well, man, I, I really hope, I really wish that that restoration would have gone better. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you ended, when you completed your restoration, your patient loved it. You were not that happy, maybe, but your patient liked it. And that is really what I want to talk about right now. Dr. Guinea in 2010 came up with this study. This is published in the Journal of Dentistry. And and this is about color research. And I'm not going to go into the research aspect because color research, as we all know, it's very, very complex. It's kind of boring sometimes because there's all these words that we're not used to use daily. Practice. So it's not something that we do, even though there's a lot of formulas that we really apply, but we just don't know that we're applying it. So, but what I do, what I do like about his study is that he came up with, 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 with these terms that I'm gonna share with you, and I'm gonna give you their uh, a summary so that you can understand how difficult it is to really uh, match. You know, we all know that it's not that easy to match perfectly uh, the, uh, you know, the color of, of our patient's teeth. But how is this perceived? So what is perceptible? What, what is the meaning of the word perceptible? And what is the meaning of perceptible color? So perceptible color difference refers to the smallest color difference that can be detected by a human eye or by a human observer. And this is the, the reason why he came up with this, with this concept and the reason why he put it in his, in his publication is because this is one of the ways that they do studies and research on color. How perceptible is the difference in color between this and the natural tooth, but between this restoration and the natural tooth. So keep that name in mind. Now, the color difference that can be noticed by 50% of the observers correspond to a 50 ratio, 50% 50 perceptibility threshold. What does this mean? This means that 50% of the times 
you're going to have observers are going to have two options. Either they're going to say, yeah, this is perceptible or is imperceptible. I can see a color difference or I cannot tell that there's a difference. That's basically it. So when, and then the other half is the difference in color that is acceptable for 50% of the observers. Again, you have 50% of people that would say, you know, I can tell that there's a color difference. Another 50% of, of people that may say, hey, I cannot tell. There's only, you only have two options. So what I want you to think about in dentistry, in clinical practice, is I want you to think about these three uh, uh, terms that I'm giving you right now, these three words. Perceptible, meaning that you can tell and your patient can tell there's a difference. Imperceptible, you cannot tell nor your patient that there is a difference. But there's another term or another word that is acceptable. And that is something that we have to understand as clinicians. Sometimes we end up with restorations that are not imperceptible, but they're acceptable to our patient, meaning that they may be a, a slight color difference, but it's nothing that bothers our patients, nothing that should bother us. And that's what real aesthetic dentistry should be all about, real aesthetic conservative dentistry. Because when you're talking about aesthetic dentistry and you're, you know, you're, you're restoring 10 anterior teeth from, from bicuspid to, uh, to, from a premolar to premolar, hey, I mean, how can you go wrong? How can it not be imperceptible? You're gonna restore 10 teeth and you're gonna make them all match either with veneers or composite. But when you're doing single tooth restorations, when you're doing a single class four on a number eight or a number nine, that changes everything. So for us, for dentists like me that have a very uh, conservative mind, these words mean a lot because I'm trying to do the least I can for my patients. I'm not trying to do 10 or 20 teeth to make everything match just in sake of aesthetic dentistry. I'm trying to make my restorations today I have learned that I have to accept that I am not perfect and that I may have some cases where it's going to just be acceptable and it's going to be really hard for me to make them imperceptible. And that's just a, that's just a reality. And that's what I want. I want to share this with you because I know as a clinician and I know that you guys out there and you ladies out there listening to me for sure understand that this is something that happens every day. So I'm going to show you a couple of my cases so that I can share with you what I think about this concept. Now, this patient comes to me. You can see all the lesions that she has. She comes to the practice. She was going to be here for a couple of days in the United States. So I just needed to go ahead and that same day that she sat at my chair, go about restoring this case. So no time to look at the photos, no time to stare, you know, to, to analyze and to look at color mapping. And her main concern was my teeth are decayed. I'm, high, I'm having hypersensitivity and I have these old restorations that are now super visible. And you can see the one in the incisal third of number nine. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and isolate. I'm going to remove all the decay and I'm going to restore this case again, because I didn't look at the case in any other way than just a restorative case. I want to get rid of the decay. I want to give this patient nice and healthy teeth back. I'm just going to use a single shade. And that's what I did. I used a single shade. I did not use any effects. I did not use any enamel. This is all dentin shade. This is immediately after I removed my rubber dam. And I want you to focus on eight and nine. And I want you to focus on those in, on the incisal third of both eight and nine, where you can see a little bit of translucency through my composite. Well, those were the areas where the patient didn't have any enamel. Those were the areas where I needed to be a little bit more uh, um, understand a little bit more what I was doing, adding maybe a little bit of a, of a white opaque before I added my dentin so that I can block away any light going through that area since I did not have any enamel and dentin backing them up. So I know that I needed to create more opacity. So this is a perceptible restoration. We can all see this. We can all agree that this is a perceptible restoration, but for this patient was acceptable. This was better than what the patient had before. But the idea is that we can see these restorations. That's what we call a perceptible restoration. Now I'm gonna share with you this other case. Now for this case, totally different situation. Patient comes in, he's unhappy with his worn down eight and nine. You can see the, the wear on the incisal edge. One of them had fracture when he was a lot younger. So we're, we're now gonna go ahead and just restore those incisal edges. And we're gonna lengthen these teeth a little bit more. But look at the photo. Look at all this gray, brown, white, blue, I mean, you 
can see the amount of color that there is on, the, on that incisal third. So what am I gonna do? I know that I have to layer this case. I know that I'm gonna have to isolate. I know that I'm gonna have to use enamel, dentin, white opaque. I know that I'm gonna have to use a lot of these stains so that I can recreate nature just like the patient had. It. So this is what I do. This is immediately after removing the rubber dam. Now, the only thing you can see here between eight and nine, immediately after removing rubber dam, so I'm telling you, these teeth are dehydrated. And you can see that little line on the incisal third of number eight, a little bit of the line left behind between the junction of the tooth and the composite. It is important for me to state that these two teeth were not prepared in order for me to restore. They were only acid edge, prime and bond, and then restore. So no burr was used on these teeth. But the reason why it's slightly perceptible on number eight and imperceptible on number nine is because the teeth are dehydrated. Because six months later, and this is the before on the left-hand side, and the after six months later on the right-hand side, these restorations are imperceptible. So we do have the capabilities with the materials that we have today to try and do the best we can to get these imperceptible restorations. And my final trick, my final trick number seven is with this case. And the reason why I wanna share this with you because this is the last thing I do. Again, I told you at the beginning when I use the Vita Shade Pan, the Vita Shade Tab from the Vita Pan, we know now that the companies, they try to match that middle third, but Vita is a ceramic company and we are talking about composite. So they're never gonna match perfectly. So all you're trying to achieve with your Vita Pan is to select your basic shade, kind of have an idea what matches better. So what I do after that is I grab whatever system I'm using, whatever restorative system I'm using, and I'm gonna grab some other dentin, and I'm gonna say, okay, if I chose A2 or A1, in this particular case was A2, I'm gonna grab what appears to be, you know, their A2, their A3, and maybe their A1 dentin, and I'm gonna fabricate these little these little composite balls, I'm gonna put them right on the facial aspect of their teeth and I'm gonna light cure this. Now this was done, it wasn't done the day that I was gonna do the restorations. This was done the day of my first appointment, okay? And just for me to have an idea, I took these photos so that I could come back to my office and look at the photos. And I want you to look at the photo on the left-hand side. You can see I have two different dentins there. I have a lighter dentin, a little bit more darker dentin. On the right-hand side, I have my enamel shade. And you can see that the enamel was right on the spot. Now I want you to look at the position of these composite balls. These little balls are light cured. So that I put them on the tooth, I light cure them, and I leave them there and then observe them. And I want you to see the position. My dentin is positioned in the middle third of the tooth. That's my 80%, that's my basic shade. I'm gonna choose one of those two from that middle third. On the right hand side, I have my enamel ball. And I'm gonna place that enamel ball right on that incisal third, where I do I know that I have a little bit more of enamel. So I'm now going to look at these photos. And I'm going to say, well, what matches better? And that's how I go about making my final decision for my shades. So then I isolate, I remove the old composites, I start applying my dentins, I do my, my white halo, I create, I, I apply my grays, I do my final enamel layer, I do my, my developmental grooves, then I go to the other tooth and I do exactly the same thing. I create a little bit of a, of a, a surface texture with, with some burrs, and then I go about polishing all these composites. This is right after I completed my restorations on eight and nine. You can see that, uh, you can see I restore a little bit on the facial aspect of number seven as well, which had a little notch. Yeah, you can see that I have enamel. These are not imperceptible restorations. These are, these are acceptable restorations. This is 30 days later now taking photos, side view photos of both my restorations on eight and nine. So this is how I go about, you know, selecting my final shade and trying to make sure that I get the best result as I can, understanding that there's a threshold of perceptibility, imperceptibility and acceptability on my side and on the patient's side.